Hey everyone, welcome back to Think Tech. In today's podcast, we'll talk about Java threads. In this episode, we'll talk about how to understand multi-threading in Java. So, if you are a Java programmer, you would know that multi-threading is an essential part of developing high-performance and efficient applications. So, understanding how to use threads in Java is crucial. We'll be discussing what Java threads are, how they work, how to create and run them. We'll be also exploring synchronization and deadlocks. We'll talk about thread pools and thread executors. We'll also discuss some concurrence utilities, best practices for thread safety, as well as best practices for using threads in Java in general. So let's get started. To begin with, let's define what threads are. In computing, a thread is a lightweight process that can run concurrently with other threads in a single process. Threads share the same memory space and can access the same data, allowing multiple tasks to be performed simultaneously. So every process has multiple different components or compartments of memory. The two major components compartments are the stack and the heap memory. So the stack memory for every thread is different. However, the heap memory for all the threads which are part of the same process is the same. And that is why we say that they share the memory space and therefore can access the same data that is present in that heap memory compartment. In Java, threads are an essential part of the language. They are objects that extend the thread class or implement the runnable interface. When a thread is created, it runs in its own thread of execution which allows multiple threads to run concurrently on the CPU cores. Java threads offer several benefits, including increased performance, improved resource utilization, as well as better responsiveness. They are widely used in applications such as web servers, database servers, and video games, and in all other scenarios where multiple user connections or multiple client connections are required to serve the service. Now that we know what threads are, let's talk about creating and running threads in Java. To create a thread, we need to extend the thread class or implement the runnable interface. The runnable interface provides a single run method, which is the entry point for the thread's code. In Java, we create threads using the new keyword followed by the thread class or the runnable interface. We can also start a thread by calling the start method, which runs the thread in a separate thread of execution. Stopping a thread can be done similarly by calling the stop method, but this method has been deprecated from last few versions as it can cause some unexpected behavior. Instead, what best practice nowadays is, you can use the interrupt method to signal a thread to stop and then use the is interrupted method to check if the thread has already stopped or not. So as we discussed that Java threads share the same memory space and can access the same data, the same heap space they share and can access the same heap data. This can lead to problem when multiple threads try to access the same data simultaneously. And this is where synchronization comes in. Synchronization is nothing but a process of ensuring that only one thread can access a shared resource at a time. We can synchronize a method or a block of code using the synchronized keyword which is provided by Java. When a method or block is synchronized, only one thread can execute it at a time, ensuring that the shared resource is accessed safely and is accessed by only one thread at a time. However, synchronization can lead to deadlocks. A deadlock occurs when two or more threads are blocked waiting for each other to release resources. So for example, if thread A holds resource A and is waiting for resource B and whereas the second thread holds resource B and is waiting for resource A, then we say that these two threads are in deadlock because they are holding resources which are required by the other thread to use. To avoid deadlocks, we can use strategies such as avoiding nested locks, using a timeout when acquiring locks and ensuring that locks are released in the same order they are acquired. So there are a lot of well-documented, well-researched techniques to avoid deadlocks and we can use any of those to avoid deadlocks in threads in Java as well. Now creating and managing threads can be a very costly operation and creating too many threads can lead to performance issues. And this is where thread pools and executors come in. 
So a thread pool is a collection of threads that are started at a or they basically are created at a startup time and can be reused multiple times. Thread pools improve performance by reducing the overhead of creating and destroying threads. So it is basically a abstraction that is given out to developers so that the low level tasks of creating and destroying threads is abstracted from the developer code and these libraries can take care of creating and destroying threads. Executors are again a high level abstraction that manages thread pools and provide a convenient way to execute tasks asynchronously. The executor framework provides several classes that can be used to execute tasks in a multi-threaded environment. These classes are executor service, thread pool executor and schedule executor service. So please check out these class if you want to use the executor service framework to run and manage threads. Now in addition to thread pools and executors, Java also provides a set of concurrency utilities that can be used to develop thread save applications. These utilities include classes such as concurrent hash map, atomic integer and countdown latch. So let us understand what is concurrent hash map. Concurrent hash map is a thread safe version of the hash map class which we all know. This can be used to store and retrieve data in a concurrent environment. So in a normal hash map class, if there are multiple threads which are trying to either insert or update the map, the Java code will fail with a runtime exception, which basically more or less says that concurrent modification for the data structure is not allowed. Whereas to counter that, we have an implementation of hash map as concurrent hash map where it is a thread safe version of the hash map class and multiple threads can update and add keys to concurrent hash map. Atomic integer again is a thread safe class that provides atomic operations such as incrementing and decrementing without the need for synchronization. So one of the major problems that we face with multi-threaded programs is the problem of lost updates. So this is something that we will not go into detail, but you can read through it or read about it in detail on other sources. But I'll give you a high level overview of what the problem is. So if there is a single variable that multiple threads are trying to update, if we do not add a lock or a synchronization block on that update code, then multiple threads will can potentially update the same variable at the exact same time. And there might be some updates that get lost because there is no proper synchronization that is set on the piece of code which is updating this variable. To avoid that, Java has introduced a thread safe class for atomic operations which is the atomic integer which can be used for incrementing and decrementing and this is said to be safe even when multiple threads are trying to update the same variable. Countdown latch again is a synchronization aid that allows one or more threads to wait for a set of operations to complete. So these utilities are designed to provide a high level of concurrency and thread safety while minimizing the need for synchronization. Thread safety is a critical aspect of multi-threaded programming. It refers to the ability of a program to work correctly in a concurrent environment where multiple threads can access the same data. To ensure thread safety, we need to synchronize the shared resources and use thread safe classes and methods as we discussed above. We also need to avoid race conditions where multiple threads are competing for the same resource and also ensure that our code is atomic, meaning that it executes as a single indivisible unit. So thread safety, we need to keep all these parameters in mind and only when all these parameters are met, we say that our code is thread safe and it can be run concurrently by a multiple threads or in an environment which is concurrent where multiple threads are running the same piece of code. Now let us discuss about some of the best practices for using Java threads. When developing multi-threaded applications in Java, it is actually very essential to follow these best practices to ensure that your code is first efficient and then effective as well. So I'll give you some high level tips that you can keep in mind for writing effective and efficient Java threads programming or Java threads utilization. The first and the foremost best practice is to use some abstraction like thread pools and executors to manage threads. 
getting your own implementation or adding your own implementation for managing threads is very cumbersome and can have some hidden bugs which you might not be able to test and will only surface during production scenarios so it is better to use these time tested well documented executor classes which will ease the operation of creating and managing threads for you and will take away all the complex part of that code then the next best practice is to use synchronization to assure thread safety so any piece of code that you don't want multiple threads updating ensure that you add the synchronization keyword to make it a synchronization block of code so that only one thread can access or update those variables the next best practice is to avoid nested locks and use a timeout when acquiring locks to prevent deadlocks so no thread should be allowed to hold a resource for an indefinite period of time there should be a timeout and within that timeout if the resource is not released then it should automatically get released so that we can prevent deadlocks avoid using the stop method to stop threads as it can cause unexpected behavior so this is just a language barrier i'll say stop method in java can cause unexpected behavior because it i think tries to stop your thread immediately but let us avoid using stop method and instead use the method that we discussed above which is to call the interrupt method and then wait on is interrupted to ensure that the thread is ended use atomic operations to avoid race conditions and ensure that your code is atomic so atomicity of a multi threaded program is very important so you should always ensure that you are doing atomic operations and operations that cannot leave your code in an inconsistent state for example if you are trying to add or increment two variables and that is an atomic operation that you want to either add or increment those two variables or you do not want to increment any of those variables so do not put these those two increment operations as separate statements make them part of as one at atomic operation and ensure that both of them get executed or neither of them get executed the next best practice is to avoid excessive use of synchronized blocks as it can lead to performance issues now this is a very important point the whole reason that we use multi threading is to improve the performance is to divide the tasks among multiple threads so that each thread can work on its own piece of task and then we can have parallel progress of the entire task now if you add too many synchronized blocks so that becomes a bottleneck for the entire processing workload because on synchronized blocks only one thread can access that block and other threads have to wait so if you put too many synchronized blocks then even if even if it looks like that you're running multiple threads all your threads will do is wait on that synchronized blocks a lot and will not be able to give you the performance that you expect so avoid using synchronized blocks until and unless it is very very important use the volatile keyword to ensure that changes to a variable are immediately visible to all threads so this is again a good good trick and java supports it so use the volatile keyword so that as soon as you make a make a change to a variable it is visible to all the threads running as part of that process and the final suggestion is to test your code in a multi threaded environment to identify and fix any issues so many a times what we tend to do is we write a multi threaded code but all our unit test cases or all our functional test cases basically test just a single threaded use case and that is why a lot of corner cases or a lot of complex cases get missed while testing and they only surface when the code is running in production environment and that is something that we should avoid so even when you write unit test cases or even when you write functional test cases make sure that you are able to simulate how the production use case would actually look like by running multiple threads for your code and running your test cases via multiple different threads and make sure that your code runs as expected so in conclusion multi threading is an essential part of java programming and understanding how to use threads effectively is very crucial for developing high performance effective and efficient applications in this episode we discussed what java threads are how they work and how to create and manage them we also explored synchronization and deadlocks thread pools and executors concurrent utilities thread safeties and then finally the best practices for using threads in java i sincerely hope that this episode has provided you with a better understanding of java threads and that you can apply this knowledge to your own projects at your own companies 
If you are interested in learning more about Java threads, there are many resources available online including tutorials, books and forums. So keep learning, happy coding. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Be sure to listen to all our future podcasts. Do not forget to follow or subscribe. As of now this is Shivam signing off.